Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where we have quite the interesting situation to discuss. Yes, Super Mario Brothers is now officially a billion dollar picture. But one of the reasons that makes some of you so happy is that you feel, ah, oh, here's a, a legit challenger, or perhaps a new titan in Hollywood against Disney. But yet here comes Disney in the very next weekend, fighting back after Quantumania. But yet, Guardians of the Galaxy is a little rocky out of the gate already, so we're gonna talk about that. And there's also a lot at stake there for another challenger some of you have been rooting for for quite some time, which hasn't been able to do it, and that's DC, because Gunn, of course, is headed there next. And Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Volume 3's performance will, I think, set the tone and expectations for his upcoming Superman legacy film. So let's dig in! Oh, as I said, it's quite the situation. All right, so yes, it's official. It's official. We have our first billion dollar movie of 2023, and that's the Super Mario Brothers film. And those Japanese numbers have finally come on board. A lot of you were waiting for this. You were like, oh, Grace, wait until Japan comes online. How to do? Well, it finally hit, and it opened with 14.3 million and got an additional 5.7 million from South Korea, where it also finally opened this weekend. Remember, in China, its numbers were soft, if not poor, but some of you pointed that out that's because in China they don't play Nintendo video games. So you're talking about the consoles not being allowed there. So they saw Super Mario Brothers a lot like I did, because you know I don't think the movie stands on its own. You have to be a big fan, I think, to real or even just a casual fan to to really like it. So how is that Japan number? Is it good? Is it bad? Turns out it's in between. It's definitely bigger than Frozen's 2014 debut of 9.6 million, and that was a mega hit in Japan. But it's also a lot lower than Demon Slayer, which opened with 44 million in 2020. You would think, considering how, uh, that, you know, how many of you felt that Japan would love the Super Mario Brothers movie, and that, of course... Uh, Nintendo is a Japanese brand, you think it would open somewhat closer to the 44, but it didn't, fascinatingly enough. Although the holiday week there, I think it's just getting started. So maybe it's not going to be just in a weekend, maybe it'll be spread out across the upcoming week. Uh, but Demon Slayer, of course, went on to become the highest grossing film of Japan, in Japan of all time. Uh, so I still predict 200 to maybe 300 million frozen uh, which had the 9.6 million debut, did about 200 million overall in Japan. So I think Super Mario Brothers could do a little better than that because it opened a little better. So I'm saying two to 300, right? And I still think it has a solid shot at cracking the top 10 all time worldwide. Uh, but two billion or close, I don't, I, I mean, again, with this kind of movie, never say never. But the way that Japan has come online and that, you know, we're finally hitting some competition in May in the United, in, you know, the rest of the marketplace, not just the United States, although the United States and, uh, well, yeah, the United States and China are still the biggest movie markets. But anyway, I think maybe around 1.5. Maybe 1.5. I could see that's where Super Mario Brothers is going to end up, which again could be enough to get to the all time top 10 worldwide. Uh, earlier in the year, I predicted that, the year, that this year's possible billion dollar movies were Fast X, The Little Mermaid, and I had said maybe Super Mario Brothers. But then I blinked. I blinked at the last minute when I saw the movie, and again, I felt, and I believe correctly, that it's inaccessible to non fans. But yet I soon learned that there are a lot of fans. Uh, and just like the rest of Hollywood and the mainstream media, I underestimated the breadth, depth, and loyalty of the video game, not just the video game audience, but specifically the Nintendo audience. And I think not even more specifically, the Super Mario Brothers audience. I did a video recently talking about the future of Nintendo and Hollywood, and uh, I looked at the sales for, uh, for Nintendo games and nothing comes close to Mario. Uh, so nobody's gonna make this mistake again though, and look for Hollywood to aggressively ramp up video game adaptations and partnerships. Mortal Kombat 12 should start filming soon, and on Thursday's live stream, we were just talking about YouTube directing, the YouTube directing duo who landed the upcoming Street Fighter movie, which is uh, moving ahead quickly. And don't forget, of course, Sonic 3 and the Knuckles Paramount Plus show, as well as Arcane Season 2, which will someday be released. There's also Sony's Gran Turismo, which they previewed a little bit at CinemaCon, but not yet publicly. Netflix's new Pokemon show, which is a couple of years out. And then also maybe someday, Borderland, the Borderlands movie will get a release date from Lionsgate. 
So there's a lot of stuff coming, but just like the comic book movie, these adaptations, these video game adaptations will be tricky. So far, out of everything that's been done over many, many years, I remember how wonky comic book movies started out, so there's a precedent, there's a precedent. But, you know, only Arcane, The Last of Us, and Super Mario Brothers have been slam dunks. A consistent Marvel-type brand hasn't emerged in the video game space. Could that be Nintendo? That's what some fans are hoping. Uh, but speaking of Marvel, the age of video game adaptation might be right on time. As what's going on with superhero movies? Oh, it's getting wonky in that space. Even Marvel is no longer a constant. Uh, online interest in The Flash was surprisingly low this past week, even though they debuted a new trailer and actually showed the movie at CinemaCon to thousands of people who said it was great for the most part, but yet interest was low. Uh, and while critics rallied behind James Gunn's The Suicide Squad in 2021, strong critic support was one of the movie's undeniable strengths, something sorely lacking from DC movies. But then what's with the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 RT score? I mean, wow. Wow, that was a surprise. Uh, especially because, you know, the film I think is really strong. Is it superhero fatigue? Marvel finally being turned on like the rest of comic book movies? Is it too dark like The Joker? Which I thought was phenomenal, but also had a low RT score. I mean, not it wasn't rotten, but it was low. Uh, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is quite dark. But if James Gunn wants to tell a dark story, why can't he if he does it well, in my opinion? Uh, although, you know, you know, I think subverting expectations is a dangerous game. And if people are expecting a cheery uh, Ga Guardians of the Galaxy movie, uh, that's not what they're going to be getting. Uh, so like with the Super Mario Brothers movie, well, last minute critics who raised that RT score slightly uh, and audiences uh, who have their audience scores still to come and the box office, will they give uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 a reprieve? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is tracking at about 130, and it needs to at least match that, not for there to be doom and gloom headlines a week from today. Quantumania barely cleared 100 million, but it was still able to boast the biggest opening for its trilogy. And for Guardians of the Galaxy to be able to make the same claim, it would need to clear 146. 130 won't do it. It needs to clear 146. In comparison to other MCU summer kickoffs, which they've been doing for over a decade now, many of those movies have been Aven outright Avengers films or de facto Avengers movies. But to be fair, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is still very much a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Like even something like Doctor Strange 2 kind of played more like an Avengers movie because of all the cameos and stuff like that. Uh, so I think ideally it would be great if, if this new movie could just get that trilogy best headline. If it could just clear 146, I think it'll be in a good place. Uh, James Gunn is not only saying goodbye to his Guardians of the Galaxy, but Marvel as well. And the performance of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 with critics, audiences, and at the box office will set the tone and expectations for his upcoming Superman Legacy film, which will kick off his tenure at DC, not just as a writer-director, but as co-head of DC Studios. So next weekend is very, very important for a number of reasons, also including whether or not it will shut down the competition, because both Super Mario Brothers and Evil Dead Rise did very well on the last weekend before the summer movie season with no challengers, right? Super Mario Brothers hasn't had a challenger for the entire month of April, and Evil Dead Rise, as I predicted last weekend, held nicely, uh, especially for a horror film. However, I think that there is a palpable sense after years of domination that some fans, conservatives and beyond, are championing anything but Disney right now. It's a very weird place to be, so let's discuss. Top Gun Maverick, Nintendo, Tom Cruise, Chris Pratt, these entities are enjoying tremendous support as both, an, and not just online, not just in chatter, they have the box office numbers to back it up, both as an alternative to Disney and celebrating conservative or at least let's just say message-free entertainment, uh, which you know I think is a little scary and a shame. I, I think that to, to be totally honest, I think a lot of the message entertainment has fumbled and done a poor job and been preaching and checking boxes rather than telling really good organic stories and that's what they need to do to succeed. But I also think to some degree some audiences aren't giving uh, them a chance. I, I re-watched Peter Pan and Wendy yesterday, loved it even more, especially once I got past the, you know, subverting expectations. I was expecting something like the 1953 animated movie. What I got was something quite different. Uh, and so seeing it a second time, knowing that going in, I liked it even more from the beginning. 
But I was thinking about the Ted Lasso speech that he gave at the end of season one about be curious, and I felt bad that a lot of people just instantly dismissed the new Peter Pan and Wendy rather than taking a moment to think, you know, why did David Lowry make the changes that he did? And before any of you say, well, Grace, you just dismissed the Nintendo, the Super Mario Brothers movie, I think that's fair to some degree. I certainly did not realize how big the fandom was, but I think, you know, Super Mario Brothers is not good from a filmmaking perspective at all. And many, many people back me up on that. Uh, but, you know, the fans loved it. And again, there's that anti-Disney sentiment that is also very, very strong. Do not underestimate this. So I would wager that this support is becoming so strong that Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, that might be a billion dollar movie after all. Many of you have said it would, it would be, but the other Mission Impossibles have been so far from a billion, I didn't think it could close the distance. But this is such a strong push, so strong, that if Mission Impossible, is it, if the story that they're telling stays out of politics, you know, and is able to at least be ambiguous or, you know, so ambiguous that certain groups can claim that it promotes what they want it to, that it could ride the coattails of Top Gun Maverick to a billion. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Uh, Chris Pratt, of course, is in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So shouldn't that help? And his Christian faith has been front and center in almost all the press he's been doing. Even when he talked about saving James Gunn's job at Marvel, he talked a lot about how it was attributable to God. So it was a lot, there was a lot of that in there. A lot, a lot, a lot. So you would think maybe that would help this movie. Maybe it will. And also, will James Gunn's very supportive fan base rally? They weren't enough to save the Suicide Squad, although people like to point out that that did debut, fairly, uh, day and date on HBO Max. But are they like DC fans, where James Gunn's fans are only active online and they either don't show up to theaters or there aren't enough of them to make a big enough difference? That's possible. You couldn't get Peacemaker to have really moved the needle. I mean, again, the headline there was that it was the biggest for an HBO Max show, you know, just HBO Max, but we know those shows do abysmal numbers. So being the best of that crop isn't necessarily a good thing. So we'll see. We'll get a clearer picture in the coming week. The Rotten Tomatoes score is not a great sign, but there's only 100 reviews that have come in so far, and there are a lot more to go, a lot more to go, hundreds more to go. So the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 RT score could go up or down. Which direction do you think it will go in, and do you think it will matter? You know, one minute there are groups that are saying that Rotten Tomatoes is out of touch with Super Mario Brothers, but then they turn around, it's the same critics. They turn around and they say, oh, thankfully those critics are finally being honest with Disney movies and Quantumania. And you can see the pattern. It's all focused around being an anti-Disney agenda that's being pushed very hard right now. And I think, to some degree, is having an effect. I think you, you, can, you cannot deny that there is having an effect. Uh, as for this week, and, but I think Gardens of the Galaxy Volume 3 is a great movie. So I'm very curious to see how it all uh, sh shakes out this coming weekend. As for this weekend, again, Super Mario Brothers and Evil Dead Rise both had fantastic holds. Super Mario Brothers in its fourth weekend, yet still dropping, this time under 40%. Ugh, it still needs about another 150 million to make the all-time domestic. I don't know if it can do that with all the competition that's coming online in May, but let's see. Let's see how, how much of a dent Guardians makes. Um, I think 150 is a lot, even with these holds, but we'll see, we'll see. A handful of movies opened this weekend, but let's be honest, speaking of being honest, clearly none of them were really theatrical releases. What did they release them for? I guess for the, for the publicity, for when they eventually go to, to streaming and digital. Now, Judy Bloom hasn't been popular in decades, and with all due respect to Rachel McAdams, the movie doesn't have enough star power. Plus, this is really fascinating, Netflix and other streaming services churn out coming-of-age content around the clock these days all of which is much more modern and makes Bloom's work, I think, seem quaint by comparison. So I think that this movie, this book's been around for decades. It certainly, I think, missed its window. And maybe also because they chose not to update the material. And then it turns out Star Wars fans were thrilled to see OG movie Return of the Jedi on non-premium screens. Look at it, look at it, look how high it is. Drawing bigger than new movies, Zizu and Big George Foreman. While Bo is afraid, and imagine how well Return of the Jedi could have done on some premium screens. But anyway, Bo is afraid in its third weekend is not finding an audience. It's just not happening. It's fallen out of the top 10 already, and this wasn't a competitive top 10. So it's not good. Not good. I think Ari Aster, you know, he didn't spend as much money as Damien Chazelle, but I think he's definitely, you know, dinged himself.
As for John Wick Chapter 4, now it delivered a franchise best for sure, but it won't crack 400 million worldwide. So the significant increase in budget, more than doubling the last film's budget, doesn't seem to warrant I think another, a, a repeat of that, a fifth entry, which Lionsgate was kicking around after that Bafo opening. Did the lack of premium screens, speaking of premium screens, did the lack of premium screens leave money on the table with this film? I think for sure that it did. I think for sure. And are we going to see a repeat of this situation of March with June, which is also overbooked with no breathing room? It's fun for us big movie fans who get to go to a huge film on a premium screen every single weekend, although with uh, The Flash and Elemental, I guess one of them will have to take IMAX and one of them will have to take Dolby or they'll do that thing where the matinees are for the family movie and the flash is for the evening although I think both want to be not just family movies but for everybody you know they both want to be four quadrant performers oh that's that's not great but you know we'll see I'm surprised not after March I think which I think really hurt particularly John Wick chapter four and Dungeons and Dragons that none of the June movies moved to August which is so open there's just nothing but wide open terrain there, man. I think it was a mistake. I think somebody should have moved. I think somebody should have moved. I mean, get over yourselves, man. Go, go make the money. But we'll see what happens. We'll watch June very closely. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun for us. It's going to be fun for us. Uh, but I think that, you know, what's done is done for John Wick Chapter 4. It's done. That was an unfortunate situation. At this point, uh, maybe that should have opened in August, right? At this point, better to let John Wick, the franchise, go out on top. Let Chad Stahelski, uh, Keanu Reeves, and 87 North focus on launching and creating their next big franchise. John Wick, of course, will live on with the Continental prequel series on Prime Video with Mel Gibson. We'll see if conservative audiences come to the rescue yet again. Uh, although I think even Mel Gibson is a little bit too much, even for that group for the most part. Uh, and then, of course, there's the ballerina spinoff, which is rumored to be a prequel and John Wick might show up. Uh, I worry that these, though, will only dilute the IP, uh, especially without Stahelski and Reeves, you know, involved or deeply involved. We'll see what happens. We'll see. I would have, you know, taken a long break and then maybe told another story another day, you know, like five years from now or six years from now. We'll see. Also, I hope Chad Stahelski has maybe realized that he's not a four quadrant director and might want to think about that as he himself tries to level up. Because while John Wick has its fans, it's been proven not to be a four-quadrant franchise. Uh, now, that doesn't matter if you keep those budgets low, as the first three films did, but they tried to level up to being a four-quadrant film with a $100 million budget. They leveled up the budget, but not the dynamic appeal of the movie itself. And it just didn't work out. Although, again, where was premium screens what were really to blame? All right, over on streaming, Adam Sandler might have been banished to streaming because, uh, you know, a lot of you guys were like, Adam Sandler, when I talked about Guardians of the Galaxy having a lot of guns, friends, and family in the movie, some of you pointed out, well, Adam Sandler does it, but it tanked Adam Sandler's career. Also, I think it's hurt Wes Anderson. People don't like when anybody does it. Um, so Adam Sandler used to ca he cast all his friends. He, phones, he started phoning it in, and he would, you could really tell that he was not so much making movies, but getting paid vacations from the studios. But Netflix, I think, is a good home for him, where he continues to make moderate efforts, and you don't have to pay anything extra to watch those efforts. Murder Mystery 2 isn't as good as the first film, but it's better than The Gray Man, I have to say, and it has less of Sandler's friends than usual. So that's a plus. And for the first time in weeks, we see a movie doing big numbers. It cracked uh, a thousand, you know, a thousand. Uh, you know, they do the, you know, that's of course not actually a thousand, but, you know, that's what we're, that's the number we're looking at. The Mandalorian is also managing to stay competitive, right? Although we haven't gotten to the controversial episode six yet on Nielsen's charts. That'll be next week, and we'll see if that inflicts any damage. Uh, and you'll notice, though, also that the Bad Batch season two, which was airing simultaneously as The Mandalorian, uh, had, had a season one already under its belt, which should have boosted its Nielsen numbers, and is spectacular. It's a great second season. Never once do we see it on these charts. So, you know, there's a lot of show. I mean, you're, you know, there's so much stuff on streaming and think of how little of it we see on these charts, which is, I think, one of the reasons that you're starting to see the studios move a little bit away from streaming. Uh, and look, Ted Lasso 3, though, managed to break into the top 10 on the overall chart. That's, woo, that's good because it was looking a little weak out of the gate there. And it's important that Apple's crown jewel not lose too much of its luster, especially with rumors, this was sad, coming out this week that Severance Season 2 is a mess and likely isn't coming out anytime soon as they desperately try to fix it. Oh no, how did they let that happen? And while it's, I guess it was too soon to claim that Ben Stiller was a, a, a producing uh, 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 savant, 
And while it's nice to see succession on the acquired chart, oh, isn't that nice? You can see that while HBO definitely owns Sunday nights on social media, uh, in the conversation, the size of that audience varies significantly from show to show. It ain't a Game of Thrones. It ain't a House of the Dragon. It ain't a Last of Us. Season four has just started though. And after the first episode, I saw a lot of people being like, all right, let me get into this so I can join the tweets on Sunday night. So we'll see if it rises up at all on these charts in the weeks ahead. Over on Netflix, nothing interesting is happening in the movie section here either, you know, although Murder Mystery 2 was cool. But with series, uh, The Diplomat had a solid debut. Great show, great show. I don't know if that has broad appeal either, but I sure enjoyed it. And I think it has a solid debut. We'll see if maybe it goes up a little bit next week. Uh, and Beef, speaking of staying power, Beef, despite the, gr uh, the growing controversy over David Cho, that's still holding steady. That's still holding steady. Neither, though, is on the level of the night agent, which is getting very little attention in the mainstream press or even on social media. It's no Wednesday, right? That was talked about everywhere. And by the way, that's back in the top 10 this week. Uh, does Netflix finally have its own Reacher, Jack Ryan, and the Terminal List? Does the night agent skew conservative? I wonder. It makes me wonder. Uh, pop, those are popular shows on Prime Video, also largely ignored in the pop culture landscape, with their cast not really getting too much stuff, particularly... I would have thought, um, uh, well, uh, what is Alan, Alan Richman, right? Richardson, right? Uh, I forgot his name. But, you know, he has a small part in Fast X, but I would have thought Alpha Reachery would have got more stuff. Um, and, you know, I think that John Krasinski is getting a lot of stuff off of uh, Quiet Place. Um, so I, 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 the, the night agent, he had, the, the lead there hasn't really gotten anything. And so I think that's, I think that's fascinating. Then on iTunes, Disney's Avatar 2 and Quantumania do continue to dominate, in large part because they've gone on uh, with all the other studios to withhold their latest releases from their streaming services. So you have to wait if you want to watch it at no extra cost at Disney+. Plus. Universal started it, HBO Max decided to jump on, and now even Disney's doing that. Uh, Qu Quantumania doesn't hit Disney+, Plus until May 17th, and there's still no date for, for Avatar 2. Uh, but Scream 6, Scream 6, I'm surprised how low this is for its first week on digital. Sure, it's only available to purchase at 20 bucks a pop. Maybe it'll do better when the price point goes down for rental on May 9th. But still, when big new movies hit digital, they're usually top three. Uh, and so I wonder why for this franchise that's not the case. Oh, oh I know. It also hit Paramount+. Plus at no extra cost this weekend because Paramount is not on this bandwagon. Oh, maybe soon they will be when they see what happened to Scream 6. All right, mystery solved. As for this coming weekend, yes, Marvel is hoping Quantumania will be just, was just a small hiccup uh, as they get ready to once again kick off the summer movie season, this time with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And in an interesting bit of counter-programming, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 will be going up against the coronation of King Charles III. But that's happening in the morning on Saturday, airing live on all the major networks from 5 to 10 a.m., Eastern Standard Time, uh, starting 2 to 3, the actual coronation's 6 a.m., 3 a.m. On the, on the West Coast. Uh, and we'll see how many people tune in. A lot of performers said no thank you. Elton John and Adele, they have c uh, conflicts in their schedule. Uh, and then people like Harry Styles and the Spice Girls just outright said no. Uh, I think it's because a lot of them realize that they have an overlap with Diana's fans, and they either want to stay neutral or be officially Team Diana. But well, it's, you know, it's still, it's the coronation of a major monarch, uh, and we'll see how many people uh, tune in. Uh, are you gonna watch? I'll, I'll DVR it and uh, check out the highlights. Uh, as for, so uh, I don't, I don't, cause Guardians of the Galaxy, you can still see that in the evening. So I don't think that that's keeping any movies from opening. I think there aren't a lot of movies opening this weekend because of Guardians. But I do think that the coronation's keeping streaming a little light this week. Uh, because HBO, HBO continues to expand from Sundays to also Mondays now as well. They've thrown an anchor into another night. And after Perry Mason season two just wrapped, so good. Go back and binge it if you didn't see it. But the White House Plumber starts tomorrow night. That looks good to me. I'm going to check that out. Then on third, is anyone watching Love and Death with Elizabeth Olsen? I don't think so. It's just, it's just an HBO Max show. It does not have that HBO boost. Then on, we'll see what happens when Max launches later this month. Then on Thursday, Netflix has their big Bridgerton spinoff with Queen Charlotte's origin story. HBO Max has season three of the other two. Season three? I didn't even know there are two other seasons of that. 
And then Peacock drops Bubkiss, which is getting company-wide support because Pete Davidson is also hosting SNL on Saturday evening. What a day Saturday could be for you. You could start your morning with the coronation of King Charles III, go and see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in theaters, and then wrap up with Pete Davidson on Saturday Night Live. Uh, and then on Friday, Apple TV starts Silo, starring Rebecca Ferguson. Promote this stuff, Apple. Promote this stuff. All right, and so that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of Super Mario Brothers officially joining the Billion Dollar Club? How high do you think it will go now, now that you see what Japan's likely to do? And how do you think Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 will do this coming weekend? Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.